Ladies and gentlemen, we have a great show today. Spags and I are ready to grind some pro day film. And to do it, Spags, we've brought in a heavy hitter, a man who knows his way around shirtless men exercising on the turf. So that really could be anybody in the DFS <laughs> industry, but it is in fact Josh Norris, the underdog football show, which you need to also be checking out, subscribing, um, doing whatever you need to help get that show going. But we're going to talk some pro day, going to catch up on a little bit of free agency. And uh, I'm excited to see the future of these young men unfurl before our eyes, be they shirtless or otherwise. So let's get into it right now. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another edition of Splash Play, where in our off-season journey, we continue to cover every possible corner of football in the efforts to fill the many weeks before football starts up again. <laughs> but I'm Chris Spaggs, joined by Peter Overzet, who has some important things that he can plug coming up in a bit. But let's get to our guest, a man you've seen around the fantasy football industry for years now, a man who is now the host of the Underdog Fantasy Football Show, or just football show, really, covering everything. He's Josh Norris. How are you doing, Josh? I'm wonderful. I'm so glad to be here. There's nothing else I would rather be doing on a Friday at about one o'clock Eastern than <laughs> hanging out with both of you. And as you mentioned, talking about athletic profiles. I mean, could life get any better, guys? Yeah. And, uh, you know, a big question Eric's asking in the chat. You obviously have the new camera set up looking nice and fresh here. Yeah. Do you have new soundproofing? Because people want to know if we're going to hear the trains going by like usual. Uh, you will absolutely hear the trains going by. Uh, one, I always appreciate when people say that because then I know they officially listen to the podcast and they're not yeah. people who just like, you know, pedal it out because we do that for other people's content. Let's all be honest with each other. We'll be like, oh, I can't wait to listen to this thing that you are producing and then we never get around to it. But yeah. yes, the, the trains absolutely go by. Uh, Pete, I mean, if I hopped on this train, I could probably get up to you in Boston. Like I am on the, yeah. the New Haven to Danbury line where it, you know, disconnects to both angles. Yeah. Uh, so it's just constant trains here about every five or 10 minutes. So you'll hear, you'll hear. Well, it's like, you know, they, they talk about movies. They'll be like, you know, New York city is actually like a character in the movie. I mean, the, the train, you know, the train going by is a character in a Josh Norris podcast. It is. It is. Uh, and it also speaks to the salary that I had been receiving for a very, very long time, <laughs> that this is what I could afford here in Fairfield County, Connecticut. So. Unshackled Josh Norris, ready <laughs> to let throw around the haymakers. I, I love feel it. like if you have the brick wall in your apartment, too, it only adds to the vibe, the creative vibe. You have the beautiful camera there. It could be you're doing your bachelor audition tape. Could be that you're doing some football <laughs> content. Either way, glad to have you on board, but make sure to follow at Josh Norris. Also follow at Splash Play Pod because we are following back everybody who follows is on there because we have no standards of living and we also appreciate you guys very much so make sure to follow at splash play pod on twitter and instagram let's talk a little bit about some of the uh the news that's gone on i guess it's our last show and the offseason updates i feel like every time i put into a deshaun watson headline because i feel like you have to talk about it even though pete and i are gravely uncomfortable talking about it publicly. I'm sure Josh on the same boat with us, but uh, he now has over 40 masseuses speaking either negatively or positively about him. And one news article I saw this week I thought was just worth referencing. Again, we're trying to do this in as PC as safe a way as possible. Former offensive lineman Jermon Bushrod of the Saints, I think most famously mm -hmm. might have had a few other stops, claimed he had half as many masseuses in his 12-year career. Then deleted tweets said, no way I could have multiple therapists per game week to get familiarized with you, your body, and know your issues and how your body responds to massage so maybe throwing some shade at Watson and and Josh. Now I'm going to put you right here on the stove, and you can say whatever. What a debut! No, no softballs for Josh to start. Just coming out right. You got the train banter oh out of the way. Gosh. Let's get to the good stuff, and let's let's decide the credibility of legal claims. So, um, just how do you feel like this is going for Deshaun Watson? Let's say that. Let's let's keep it very high level. Thankfully, I spoke about spoke with someone who's very knowledgeable about this situation uh, for the show that actually releases on Monday, uh, Charles Robinson of, of Yahoo, uh, who's outstanding. And basically this cannot get settled by the April 29th date, right? Unless all of like everyone gets in the same room, which is absolutely not going to happen right now. And they're able to work on, uh, you know, ways to, to settle all these cases, but that does not mean that Deshaun Watson is not going to get traded. And he actually brought up that the Jets are still involved, that the Dolphins are still involved, the Panthers are absolutely still involved, but he firmly believes that he will never play 
a snap for the Houston Texans ever again. So what I'm doing now is rather than give my opinion on the situation, I'm just passing along someone else's opinion of the situation. That's literally every con piece of content I do is just regurgitating and slightly repackage repackaging someone else's original thought, Josh. So you're, yep. you're in good company here. <laughs> and I, I will say, I think there is something from the pro athlete standpoint of, you know, locking on to one or two people like you were talking about Spags of like, do, how many people are you going to trust in your circle? And there is something uncommon, weird, odd about going to 20 plus 40 ish different massage therapists over the years. That just doesn't seem like something is typical, typical because when, when these pro athletes find people they trust, they kind of lock into them for years and, and decades. And, and that is not the case in this standpoint, but I don't know. I have zero experience being a pro athlete. If that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, by that camera and the way that it makes you look so handsome, I would have thought that you had 10 years of pro QB, but uh, uh, <laughs> on, on the other side of that though, my, my NFL combine is out there on YouTube as well. So uh, you, you can, you can find both angles of this. Yeah, that is a, uh, that is a great clip. If you guys have never seen uh, Josh do it, the one thing Josh, when Rovell did his 40 time and became the de facto gift, were you relieved? Yeah. Because now that's the one they use. They don't use the Josh Norris gift. Any athletic test that Darren Rovell does, it makes me look better. So, yes. so the more of them that happen, I am thrilled. It just, yeah. and I will say there are other things that I did at NBC. Like I went up and did the lumberjack games up in a small town in, in Wisconsin. And so I had to like roll on logs and, and run on <laughs> logs and, and try to climb trees and do all that stuff. That's even worse. I did the CrossFit games as well, Pete. I'm sure that might be up your alley. Uh, and that was obscene. It was absurd. And I'm not sure, like looking back on all these things, I wonder why they asked me, a guy who sits at his computer for 10 hours and is better at talking about athletic testing than actually doing the athletic testing. I think you just answered things. your own question there, yeah. Josh. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. I, I have to say my big fear of the lumberjack one would be the log where they're, you're going on the rolling log because I feel like I would immediately fall and smash my face and knock out all my teeth. Like unquestionably, I think there's at least a 50% probability of that one. I lost to a seven-year-old multiple times. <laughs> But that seven-year-old's been trading all his life for that. I feel like you can't even be that uh, that upset or offended that he beat her. You. It was a oh, seven-year-old sure. girl. <laughs> it's, it's, so we're empowering women, even in this segment where we don't know how to talk about this QB and the possibly terrible things he's doing, but who knows? Um, just feel like we have to get this news item out there every week. And honestly, it's becoming a segment that for me, it kind of brings me joy that, that how we have to awkwardly step around this subject every week as more and more uh, horrible details come out. But Sean Watson fighting for his life now, and we'll see how it works out for him. But other news, less, I guess a little lighter news, the Rams added to Sean Jackson. And this is the one that's an uh, interesting transition from the last item, but this is the NFL offseason for you guys. And uh, Sean Jackson, a deep threat weapon for Matthew Stafford, I think, uh, low upside or you know maybe a high upside, low downside signing where they could cut him probably pretty easily. But Josh, you have any thoughts here on Deshaun Jackson being a, a field stretcher for this new Rams team? Uh, I can never quit Deshaun Jackson. Hmm. That's that's one issue that I have. I mean, I even remember 365 days ago trying to outline what the Eagles have been doing for the last two years and trying to add vertical playmakers and then being like, oh, where Deshaun Jackson is going in drafts. I absolutely love it. And then I think he's played in like, eight games over the last two seasons and barely even touched that mark. And, you know, so much of that time it's uh look, I'm, I'm more into it from a pure football standpoint um, than I would be, especially tied to Matthew Stafford than I would be if Jared Goff was there. Um, I also think that I do not want it to take snaps away from like the potential development of, of Van Jefferson. But I, I also believe this Rams team is going to look a little bit different without Gerald Everett and just how much Tyler Higby can do as the lone tight end. So I'm, it, this is an offense that I'm tracking throughout these, these off season moves, these off season practices, whatever type of OTAs that we have, because uh, it wouldn't be a surprise because Sean McVay has, has shown that he is willing to change things every single year. And I'm excited to see what he can do with a talent like Deshaun Jackson, who can still run probably at the age of 34, 35, at least for the two, first two or three weeks of the season. Yeah, I think I'm on the same page here. It wouldn't shock me at all. I would put even for our ride or die picks right now that Deshaun Jackson wins somebody at GPP this season. I don't know. That'll be an every week thing. But Pete, do you have any thoughts here? Yeah, no, it's just one of those things on paper looks like a great fit 
fits a very specific role, but then you realize there's so much other kind of nuance that goes into it actually working out. But on paper, that was what they were missing was that field stretcher to complement all their underneath options. So if he stays healthy and still has that juice, I think it'll be, uh, I think it'll work out well. And some other news came from Houston uh, that not related to Deshaun Watson. We got Philip Lindsay going to the Texans after a bit of a weird situation that looked like he was going to go back to Denver. Then they rescinded their tender for him and then let him go. Uh, took Mike Boone instead. But there's there's another headline, which I thought was interesting, that was on ESPN. And I'm just going to read it as it was. I put it in quotation marks on our little segment sheet. But Texans signed wide receiver Dante Moncrief to fill hole left behind by Will Fuller departure. Uh, so two very similar players, Josh, right? And how this is going to work for, for Houston this year. And I'm sure... Dante Moncrief going to come in and be as explosive, as dynamic as we've seen from Will Fuller. Well, look, we, we do, certainly do not want to disrespect Chris Conley on the show, but um, other than Chris Conley, let's put it this way. Uh, a lot of the moves that they've made this all season seem expansion level. Now, I actually like Philip Lindsay as a player, but there's the train. Uh, as as much as I like Philip Lindsay as a player, they've already brought in Mark Ingram on a one-year contract and restructured David Johnson's deal. So how much should we really care about Philip Lindsay going into the season? Like it might be won by week four, or week five. We care more about Philip Lindsay than we do right now. Um, I, I also firmly believe there's a chance that obviously Deshaun Watson does not play a down the Houston Texans this year. And I think their win total is at like four and a half at the moment. And if that's the case, I'll probably take the under on that one. Pete, you got any thoughts here on uh, Dante Moncrief or Philip Lindsay adding to this? I really, I think expansion level that Josh just said is the best way to refer to this Texans team. We're probably going to be Tyrod Taylor starting if we uh, see Watson either not playing or get traded somewhere else. Yeah, I, I'm with Josh. I like Philip Lindsay a lot. I think he's the most talented rusher in that backfield. The, it's just there's going to be two issues. One, we hate the three-headed monsters, right? Like David Johnson and Mark Ingram are still going to get touches. It's really hard for those three-man backfields to like result in one fantasy monster. And then if he's going to be losing pass work again to David Johnson, competing for goal line carries with Ingram, it just gets messy. I could still see him being like a very good zero RB candidate, though, like a guy you get late that throughout the course of the season kind of emerges as the top guy. Can either of you name the head coach of the Houston Texans? Please don't do this to me. I'm so bad with this stuff. <laughs> Nick Casario's the Eagles one. I know that. No, that's, um, that's, that's, wrong. that's wrong, too. Is it? Yeah. Because there's the GM of the Texans. Oh, that's okay. That's so it's Nick no, but, but, who's, the, who's the Eagles coach. Yes. You know, my, my point is, I mean, I great, even great Italian men, by the way. No, I, 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 I even had to like do a double take and reread who it was yesterday before these interviews. It's David Cully. And I think David Cully was the passing game coordinator of is it the Baltimore Ravens or he worked with the Vikings at some point too? You're asking like, guys who didn't even know Dave Coley was the coach. So yeah, I don't know if we're going to be able to help you out. So, with that so, part. <laughs> so that's the point. Like what, what is the plan here for the Texans? And it's just, it, they obviously took a nosedive with how many assets they gave up for these players. And these players just while playing well, like Larry Tunsil, it's not like they're even close to being to, to an AFC title contender. So it's, um, I don't think you can find a more miserable fan base at the moment than the Houston Texans one. It's funny. We actually talked about David Culley briefly, and I, I know because I saw the purple search text for me looking up David Culley <laughs> previously, not knowing who he is. And I think we actually talked about him on the show because I mentioned like, oh, they hired him. He's the, the Ravens passing game coordinator, probably the one guy you don't want to hire from the Ravens. And uh, yeah, that is a classic Texans hire who they, I think they initially hired to try to placate Deshaun Watson in some way. And then now he's just the dude who's going to be there being the expansion head coach slash, you know, NFL Madden head coach that you get when you fire your guy um, in a franchise year. But uh, that is the move that they've made. So good for them. And one last free agent signing, I guess, to talk I can't about. I believe you put this on the sheet. We're going to really waste Josh's time with this, Spags. <laughs> Wait until Josh hears this. The Panthers making a big no. signing, your big splash in free agency, adding Dan Arnold of the Cardinals, <laughs> who is one of one of uh, Murray's best playmakers, I would say, on the deep ball last year. And the Panthers, uh, seemingly all the moves that they're, I think, signaling this offseason seem to indicate they want to get even more involved in the deep ball. So that's why it's on here. Pete, we are the splash play show. <laughs> but Josh, Dan Arnold, how do you feel about him? It's a game-breaking change here for the, for the Panthers. I think everybody would agree. Josh, feel free to just say next question. No, my main goal here, Pete, <laughs> is just to shock you with some evaluations right now with some analysis okay um it's, it's actually i mean dan arnold technically is a tight end correct and with joe brady last year they barely used the tight end i mean there was some love for ian thomas heading in to the season now going from you know 
multiple three wide receiver set. I think they used that around 65 to 70% of the time last year. Their third wide receiver that they also brought in is David Moore. But that's a very different type than what Curtis Samuel offered last season. So I, I wonder as like a three pass catcher standpoint, if they do flip between David Moore and Dan Arnold in those situations. But most surprising is, is just the quarterback situation, how that's going to unfold because they absolutely do not want Teddy Bridgewater as the starting quarterback in 2021. That's why they offered the number eight overall selection for, for Matthew Stafford. They struck out in that deal. I've, wouldn't be surprised if they try to move for Deshaun Watson. I highly doubt they go with a rookie. Um, it's it's just going to be another like no man's land purgatory season for the Panthers. I think at like six and eleven and five and twelve. God, I thought of that in the fly. <laughs> uh, but what you're really saying is it's a Dan Arnold breakout season. I think is the subtext yes. there. <laughs> yes, I think he, he's going to add one or two wins to that team overall by <laughs> himself. He's going to be awesome this year, and we're going to look back on the show and Pete glibly laughing it off. But Josh and I will be on the right side of history, declaring Dan Arnold to be a game changer at tight end for a franchise who needs it now more than ever. me on being bearish on Dan Arnold. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's talk some NFL draft preview here. And guys, smash the like button here. If you're watching on Pete's channel, make sure you're subscribed to the Splash Play YouTube as well. Make sure to check out our podcast feeds on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, Subscribe to those and make sure to check out Josh's underdog fantasy show or football show. I keep saying fantasy show. It's more than about just fantasy it's football that josh is covering and josh give him the quick plug for that too where can they follow it where can they subscribe yeah i mean we're on apple podcasts we're on spotify we just launched a new youtube channel that nothing is up there yet but about seven or eight clips will roll out on on monday i mean it's difficult to build you know an entire content infrastructure in about a two or three week period but i think we've done a really really good job with that and i'm excited for, for what we can do. And yeah, Monday show, the first episode that morning, we'll have JT O'Sullivan, former NFL quarterback, who does a great job on his own YouTube channel of the quarterback school, and Charles Robinson. So again, whatever podcast platform you use, you can find it. It's the Underdog Football Show. Nice. Let's go check that out. And let's talk some NFL draft where the draft is now coming up. April 29th going to be the usual weekend event there. There's no full workout NFL combine this year, which college pro days being the primary method for scouting besides all the tape out there. And I'll ask this question to Josh right up top because I pulled the PFF college data right before the show. Honestly, looking at it mostly blindly where I didn't even know PFF had that that accessible. And I sorted it out, put it in my Excel, got all the data that I wanted to take a look at. But I'm going to ask you, Josh, what do you think matters the most for draft prospects? And what are the repeatable stats? that I think you can sort of say, oh, this guy did this in college. There's a decent chance he could do it in the NFL, not accounting for the fact that obviously NFL offenses are going to be the main thing, snap count, all those things we talk about with fantasy. Those are the main things that drive a guy's success. But yeah. um, but obviously there are some stats that do correlate. I wish I could give you like a quick one or two minute answer. Uh, that's just a loaded question. So I'll, I'll do my I'll do my best to, to outline it a little bit. Like I For athletic testing specifically, I think the easiest usage for it is just to eliminate bad athletes. Like that sounds simple, but like if if NFL teams just perceived athletic testing as, hey, we're going to eliminate the players who are not of the caliber of of their peers, of of their competition, then you do a great job. Like here are some running backs. I looked this up and if if I have to, do I need need to explain like what composite scores are? Would that help? Like composite, you can in an elevator pitch, sure. (laughs) Composite athletic score. So, like, I I feel like the NFL Combine has pitched us athleticism as just the forty, and and that's about it. And that's just one of seven or eight athletic tests, including broad jump, shuttle, you know, sixty yard shuttles and and periods, three cones, so on and so forth. So, what that does is it weights all of those athletic tests along with your weight because you know it's different if a 250 pound person is doing it versus a 190 pound person and it spits out you know this this composite score this this number and so you can compare that over years and years and years and so if you get like two sigma down and don't ask me what a sigma is um, but if you get two sigma down away from like the mean then that basically shows that this player is not an NFL caliber athlete let me read off some of these running backs and wide receivers I think since 2015 who didn't technically, who, who, who did not put a, a composite score in like the athletic standpoint. Okay. So these are non info caliber athletes, Demario Richard, Jihad Thomas, Matthew days, Devion Smith, Josh Robinson, Marcus Murphy, running backs, wide receivers are Tavis Scott, Bobo Wilson, Darius Rogers, Deronio Wilson, 
so on and so forth, right? And so those are all NFL Combine athletes who are invited there. So they're perceived to be like the top of their of their competition of, of, of this class, yet none of them made it, right? So again, I think the easiest usage of it is just to eliminate the ones who do not qualify as NFL Cup athletes, if that makes sense. If that makes sense at all. Yeah, I think that's so that you're looking at it more through the, you know, the combine athletic performance. And I guess my question would be then, are you throwing out or at least minifying or minimizing, I guess, the um, the amount of uh, reference that you make to like a guy's statistical performance? Because you go to the NFL, obviously, if a guy's had 10 targets a game for X amount of time, you know, there's a potential there where whether he was just filling in for somebody or if he was actually, you know, the lead dog for a team, you assume he's going to have similar performance when he goes to the next team. In college, if you see a guy who's like a 10 target guy, but he doesn't have the athletic profile, does that mean that you just immediately rule out those 10 targets per game because of the fact that he just doesn't grade out like he'll be able to create the same separation at the next level? It's a it's a great question. I I think I'm still learning so much about this. And, and Pete, maybe you can back me up on this. I think there's a lot that's tied to age and production and like when you have that production. Because if we all think of ourselves back in college, um, how different were you as an 18-year-old freshman versus like a 22-year-old graduate? And so, so often these 18 year old cornerbacks are facing seniors in college on the other side of the ball. And like it's physical development, it's, it's mental development. It's just so different. So if you see a wide receiver be productive at, you know, 18 and a half or, or, or 19 and versus, you know, in their final season, then you can say, oh, he was doing it already when he wasn't, you know, perceived to be as fully developed as as he is now. So I'm still learning about all of that stuff. Now, I also believe that the college game has kind of changed. And the more and more I've seen it, like these college offenses are putting their best wide receivers in the slot because that is just manufactured space um, against a more advantageous position of the middle of the field. And with all these college offenses just running a ton of RPOs, that it's easy receptions as well. So while like the old school mentality is, oh, we're going to put our best wide receiver on an island on the outside more and more lately. And that's why you see it with so many wide receivers in this class. It's like, oh, they played 75%, 80% of their snaps in the slot. It's just because it's easy and it wins at the college level. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what Josh was referencing there too, Rotoviz has done a ton of good work on, you know, breakout age. And a lot of it is very intuitive. Like the younger and more uh, productive these players are, the more likely they are for success. They're they're being successful against older peers. And you see that kind of play out even with NBA stuff too. Like the youngest guys are the most coveted because they are succeeding at a young age and dominating physically more mature guys than they are. So yeah, and then the tough thing is then how do you start to factor in competition, you know, and stuff like that. We've seen uh, our our cult hero, Jeff Janis, you know, he can look like Julio Jones on paper and dominate, you know, the non D1 opponents, but how does that actually end up translating? And then, you know, sometimes we get the Justin Jeffersons where he like as a prospect checked every box right. you'd want and then smashes like you want, but uh, it's not always that easy. And Spags, I would say that a major part of it is like planting your flag on on certain players and then watching them fail and then realizing like why they failed and how they failed and how you can apply that moving forward. Like a, a name from a long time ago was Jeremy Gallon, who was old at Michigan and like had his breakout age, I think at like 22 or, or 23, he ran like golden Tate and looked like golden Tate and did all that. And then he was drafted in, you know, the sixth or seventh round and then absolutely fizzled out. So you can like be so firm in your evaluations. And I was so much more earlier on than I am now with any of these draft prospects. And you kind of realize, well, one, the NFL draft is so much of a luck based system and some teams get lucky for four or five years and then fizzle out for the next three or four years. I'm looking at you, Seattle. Um, and then it's, it's also something where you just kind of help your own process in a lot of ways. And look, as you guys know, like we're, we're trying to watch, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 wide receivers and give our input on them. Meanwhile, NFL teams might draft one or two of them. And so their hit rate might be different than ours. It's interesting. Yeah, and I think there's a, a point here from Ricky Geiger in chat saying the production is overrated relative to the physical attributes pretty easily. And he's talking about Terry McLaurin and how uh, I guess some people were down on him on draft boards because he didn't have the statistical production. But he's talking about he did have the yards per route run production. And I think that's something that I would want to look at a little bit more. And I guess, Josh, we're going to talk a lot about, honestly, a lot about QBs today because these guys are popping up a lot. They have the most tape out there to kind of to look at. So we'll get into that for a second. But is there anybody in terms of wide receivers or running backs that you've seen so far just going through what you go through? 
through that have jumped out to you and maybe ones that aren't as star studded as the, I guess the Jamar chases of the world, the ones that we know are probably going to go pretty early. I haven't done any running backs yet. That's uh, my weekend assignment uh, in early next week. Wide receivers. Yeah. Th there's a number of them. I mean, I think there's this perceived top three in whatever order you want to do of Jamar chase, Jalen Waddle and Devonte Smith. Obviously the, the, the final two were on the same team. I want to throw in Terrace Marshall, who was actually Jamar Chase's teammate. Um, Chase opted out of the 2020 season. And, um, you know, Terrace Marshall entered and basically played that Justin Jefferson role often in the slot, but he's like 6'3, 210 pounds, I think, 205 pounds. And uh, one of these younger players who, Look, he's not as like animate, like it's so different when you look at these different aspects. And I, I just love to see everyone's opinion on them because like some are the aesthetic ones that like, you know, move their head and are animated in their routes and create separation <laughs> that way. And I think it's great that some people firmly believe that they can evaluate on that. Then uh, the other side is like firmly believing in the production element and the athletic scores. And I'm trying to like pick pieces out of all of them and like combine them into something, at least for me. And uh, Terrace Marshall fills a whole bunch of that. Um, and I, I would also throw out Elijah Moore, who's at Ole Miss, who uh, is a smaller wide receiver who played 85, 89% of his snaps in the slot last year. And uh, I just hope he only plays about 40 to 60% of that at the NFL because I think you have some like Brandon Cooks elements to his game. <laughs> You know, I think a guy with like Marshall too, this is something that to me, if you are even going to nickel and dime the overall volume, as, as Ricky was saying in the chat, if you look just at the, the PFF stats for Marshall, um, and again, this is me sort of working backwards here where I haven't done a ton of research on these guys. I think for me, they're going to gain relevance by where they get drafted in those situations they're in. Uh, but Terrace Marshall, 2.9 yards per route run, 81% uh, contested catch rate, like very positive signs for a guy, whether... I guess the one thing that you could sort of nickel and dime on the college level is if he's getting contested looks, maybe he can't get as much separation. But um, I guess in terms of these stats, Josh, is there anything at all that you're prioritizing looking at them? Because I know for me, historically, for the NFL level, I'm looking at a dot. I'm looking at guys' ability to get you know, yards per route run. If they're running a lot of routes and they're getting good production per a lot of routes, it's more valuable than a, um, I don't know, I was going to say Tyree Kill, but Tyree Kill initially in the league where he's running less, but has just gigantic plays on there. Is there anything that jumps out to you on the college level that is sort of a stat that crosses? is over where it's used for the NFL and in college it does make a guy jump out more meaningfully yeah like if we can compare last year like Denzel Mims and Brad Nayuk for example and I would say heading into the draft like their their perception was was very similar like they were going to be first or second round wide receivers um there but where they caught the ball was extremely different like Brandon Ayuk was I think the leader in screen catches and screen yards and um yards at the catch and broken tackles among all wide receivers last season well guess what perfectly aligns with exactly what Kyle Shanahan does and what he looks like in his wide receivers and pass catchers because George Kittle because Debo Samuel because Tevin Coleman all did that very well at the NFL level um, so a major part of his game I think like over 50 percent of his catches were within three to five yards of the line of scrimmage last year um, meanwhile Denzel Mims was someone who only had like one or two screen receptions his entire final season at Baylor. And that's just not part of his game as well. Like he's a, what about catch the air guy. yards, Josh? What about the air yards? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, Denzel Mims, I just, again, like a wide receiver is not a wide receiver is not a wide receiver. Like they all win in, in different ways. And that's why to me, like manufactured production, especially the college level can be so easily attained. And so coinciding that with what you're talking about, average depth of target or, or air yards does make a lot of sense. Okay, so let's let's get into this a little more, and I think I'm gonna go with one spicy take. And Pete, you got the clips in front of you, right? That we we're gonna pull. Yeah, here. just let me know which one I should tee up. So let's talk Trevor Lawrence. He's the big name here. This is a show where we we do try to hit you know the mainstream as much as possible, even though we dig a little deeper on the fantasy components and the betting components and all that. But Trevor Lawrence, we have his pro day highlights, and there's the full pro day video. There's also just some some nice throws he's made, and. I have to say, looking through the stats for Trevor Lawrence, I get why he's a top prospect. You can watch this video here. You can see some of the throws he's making, the rollouts, mobility, all that stuff. That said, in college, looking at the numbers for him, at least from this last season, and I'm just pulling the most recent season that he played, but it seemed to me like there's a lot of the guys creating production for him where 57% of his yards were coming yard after the catch, and that, to me, speaks to the talent around him, speaks to the offense, all that. But I think really... 
Like, I think Justin Fields, fantasy-wise, to me, looks like a more appealing quarterback. I think mm. Mac Jones maybe could be a more appealing quarterback. I get why you take Trevor Lawrence number one, but I do have some vague concerns here, Josh, that maybe he's just overvalued because he's been the guy we've put in at number one. And this is kind of a strong QB draft, and it wouldn't be the worst thing to me if you had, you know, the number two, number three pick, and you just got one of these other guys. Yeah, I, I think there are multiple lenses we, we can talk about this from. From what you're saying is, well, you don't have to like only get the first quarterback off the board if you're doing dynasty drafts or if you're doing drafts this summer. And I totally mm -hmm. agree with that because as we know, just rushing production, the great rich rebar, the Konami code, uh, that is plentiful in this year's draft class. I mean, you mentioned Justin Fields, Trey Lance will have that. I will also say Trevor Lawrence is going to have that though. I mean, how they even used him inside the 10 yard line at Clemson, even running like quarterback power and running over defenders near the goal line. It's it's impressive. I, I also want to say, and part of what you're saying, I think is going to be repeated and throughout this draft process, like there are one to two to three moments in every single game where he makes the wrong decision that like you want to give these plays back to him. He's not perfect. He's imperfect. And I think a lot of people head into it thinking he needs to be perfect because he's been in the national spotlight for like the last five to seven years. Right. But um, then there are also these moments like three to five plays a game where he absolutely just wins the game for his team. I mean, he evades pressure. He keeps his eyes up. He throws absolute laser beams down the field to contested wide receivers and completes them. And it's just, it's, it's, he's a rare talent. And I, I know people hate using the term generational and rare, <laughs> but I, I, I am okay with using it with Trevor Lawrence. I will not use it with other names on this list though. Yeah, there's a there's a PFF stat which they don't normally include with um, their normal NFL packages that I guess for some reason is in the college, maybe to indicate some stats they can't fully cover based upon some of the differences in competition and all that. But they have a stat called big time throws, which I don't know what it means, but it's on this Excel spreadsheet. And he is one of the leaders in big time throws, but also one of the leaders in turnover worthy throws. So I just think Trevor Lawrence, I don't know that he comes with a degree of risk, but I do think he comes with uh, some risk that he's just going to be one of these guys in this grouping of QB. Um, that's maybe good, but maybe not as good as it seems to be the number one pick. And that'd be my cause for concern. Pete, I know you're, you've been digging deep on all your college football research. So do you have any thoughts at all on Trevor Lawrence besides his dreamy hair, which I think definitely comes across in the pro day video? Yeah, no, I, I am not the authority here on, uh, on Trevor Lawrence here, but I am, I am curious where he's going to kind of fit in within the super flex rankings for dynasty. Cause that's normally my first kind of relation to these prospects. And it's always the push pull where you have these running backs going to the great spots, the uber talented wide receivers. And then you're like, I could lock up a guy that could just start for my team for literally 10 years in a row. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, Josh, where your kind of early reaction, like Trevor Lawrence versus the other top skill position guys. Well, look, it's the Jacksonville Jaguars, right? Um, yeah. And so it's it's a team, a franchise that we've just had a negative perception of for years and years and years. Uh, I am fascinated to see how Urban Meyer, forever a college coach, handles this pro franchise a transition that we've seen hit and miss uh, over decades. Um, I will say... Look, from a dynasty perspective, it's it's different than looking at just what their roster is heading into 2021. But we have seen many worse situations for rookies to come into than what he's going to enter, at least by the surrounding talent. I mean, James Robinson for season long leagues was basically your fantasy MVP just based on the value that he hit. DJ Chark, I think we forget what he did during his, his second season, how explosive he was there. You had Marvin Jones, who, again, is one of the best still for the last five years contested catch receivers in the NFL. And I know that Peter can talk quite a bit about LaVisca Chenault. So <laughs> is there anything else I need to say there with that group? I mean, the offensive line certainly is not perfect, but it's not like Trevor Lawrence is coming from a perfect situation from his offensive line standpoint as well. Yeah. I, I have to say, if it's funny, whenever anybody talks about the Jaguars, myself included with Pete, where it's like, clearly LaVisca is going to have a downplayed role, or at least it seems like he's going to have a downplayed role. And every, whenever everybody mentions it, I would never say that. I would never say but, that on Peter's show. But, but that's when anybody comes to the show and they mention the Jags, they go to Pete like, oh, and your boy LaVisca, Pat, Pat, like he'll be okay too. Don't <laughs> I don't need any Pats. LaVisca <laughs> is uh, a rocket ship emoji. Uh, he did everything they asked for him um, and he's going to improve. Pete, in with, year your, two with your growing Rolodex of contacts, yes. have you been able to get in touch with LaVisca ever? This is what's tough. I, I haven't, you know, I, I'm now, I got Chris Conley on speed dial, but, right. uh, LaVisca, become, I know, I know. So, uh, yeah, I need to work on it. I, I need to work on it. May, there were, I thought maybe I could triangulate with Patrick Laird in Miami. And then we right. had Conley, the former teammate, maybe. Right. 
but never meet your heroes at the same time. You know, that's true. That's all true. you need is an NFL top shot to be out there. And then you will be right in the mix with that and making all these guys, your friends. And they'll be so impressed by the man's coin. I think, especially. Hey, hey, I became friends with Patrick Laird before non-fungible tokens, okay? <laughs> That's true. That your friendship was the original non-fungible token, I think <laughs> you're saying. Uh, let's go on to another QB here. And again, it's a QB-heavy draft, and I, I'm pulling a lot of my expected spots from the NFL.com mock draft just because uh, who, who would be as unbiased as the NFL when putting together a mock draft? But a uh, QB heavy room, and it's number two. Zach Wilson was their projected number two. You can see a one pro day highlight here. There is also a full pro day video of him out there. I think Pete's also going to very much enjoy seeing Zach Wilson's face here. Boyish. Um, definitely a hint of Justin Herbert maybe combined with uh, surfer Justin Herbert combined with short haircut Justin Herbert. But I would also throw in a Disney Channel movie quarterback. Yeah. He's hunky. I think we could all he, agree. <laughs> he is so like hunky, much. though, in a in a way where he feels too young for me to say he's hunky. <laughs> uh, also, I want to point out this tweet, Spags. El video no miente, 55 yards, <laughs> lanzando, cruzado, con certeza y potencia. Let me, let me try to translate from my Spanish minor. So this video is no lie, 55 yards yards lanzando cruzado i think that's saying like a bullet or a dart with uh confidence and potential are we serious jags that you're gonna pass up on this guy i think you mostly got that my spanish is a bit rusty but and i actually honestly i went through it so fast i was just looking for the video clips on twitter i thought that was brazilian so that's how <laughs> that's how rusty my portuguese spanish. portuguese yeah that's it yeah portuguese which the, the native language of brazil of course uh <laughs> i would say that uh pete nailed that and yeah zach wilson i think to me I would say he's in the hunt. I think looking at the data, uh, more of a deep ball thrower, passer rating to me looks pretty good, though that could be a bit of the competition for him uh, not being as strong. 136 passer rating for him. Um, but yeah, the deep throws, he does throw ahead of the sticks more than behind it, which I think is a positive. More air yards, 66% or 63%, excuse me, of his throws were air yards or the yardage that he compiled were from the air yards. Uh, so to me, Zach Wilson, I think... I would grade out to be comparable just off the data, not looking so much at the body of work, but off the data, I think Zach Wilson looks as good as Justin, uh, as a uh, Trevor Lawrence to me, and maybe some of these other guys too. Yeah. Look, Zach Wilson is, is beloved during this draft process. Okay. And he's going to be the number two selection with the New York jets. Um, the thing with Zach Wilson is I get the sense. And I think we've seen this over the years, how like for decades, the NFL chased, the likes of Peyton Manning and, and Tom Brady because they were the statues in the pocket that were so good and winning for so long and so consistent that I kind of feel like the quarterback position was set back for years because that they just wanted those types and they're so hard to find. Now, I think the NFL, because what wins and what works in the NFL are these like outside of structure magicians and there have even been some links and some name drops of Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen with Zach Wilson. And while I think Zach Wilson is a, a very good prospect, one, I don't think he belongs in the tier of Trevor Lawrence. And two, I will never bring up the name Patrick Mahomes with any quarterback prospect ever. And I just feel like maybe the NFL draft process is trying to chase the evaluation that they missed out on with Patrick Mahomes and trying to find the next one with Zach Wilson. The only thing I would say to that, Josh, is estas seguro? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just love your you. accent, by the way, in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe, maybe that's what it, so Josh Spags and I put like a big board of like off-season show ideas together. Okay. And now I'm realizing Spags, one of them should have been we do an entire show in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't there a community episode that did that? I feel like they did every yeah. possible concept, but I feel like I remember them wearing fake mustaches and speaking Spanish for at least. Yeah. So, so this show is just slowly becoming a sitcom, is what you're saying. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> when, cool. when I studied abroad in Spain, I was like, I was doing the immersion program, living with a host family, and I went to visit my friend in Barcelona. And we had about a month of immersion under our belt and just cocky enough to think we could talk Spanish. Right. And we went to the bar and then we were going to the club. We're waiting in line to the club, surrounded by all these uh, real Barcelonians. And we just talked to each other. We said, we're just going to talk to each other all night exclusively in Spanish. And these, the looks we were getting from the people <laughs> in line looking at us in just our busted ass one-on-one Spanish. I've, I've never seen death stares quite like I saw that night. Like, you know, they tell you to at least try and like they'll respect if you try. <laughs> no. And then you go into like a, a patisserie in, in, in Paris and then like you try to order something and they're just like, what the hell 
are you saying? And then you just revert back within five seconds to your English and your broken, your broken yeah. style. So I, now I'm not even sure if trying is a good thing. No. And the other thing is, you know, there's places around the world where the women there are fond of an American boy, uh, in Spain. No, they want nothing to do with white pasty. Why blonde they? Boys. I'm sorry, Josh. I'm just leveling with you guy to guy, pasty to pasty. They don't like us. I right, look, I, I understand it. I'm <laughs> having that trouble here in the U.S. too. So it's not just like it's in Spain either. Those women have not seen Josh's camera yet. So I think no, that, uh, <laughs> right. the, the, the way straight to their heart is to host a YouTube channel <laughs> and to have a podcast about football. That does it every single time. I have to say the one thing that jumped out to me in terms of just pure Spanish speaking street cred was that Pete went with Barcelona. He did the lispy thing, which I've always hated because I grew up in the Bronx and a little bit Puerto Rican. I know some Spanish enough and there's two different types of Spanish. There's a Castilian Spanish, which is the one where you do the th 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 thing. And then there's like regular Spanish that people speak in America. And it is, there aren't a lot of th th thas, but, uh, but you know, Barcelona is a romantic city like that where you can lisp your way through town. You want to see a beautiful organic segue on a football show. Josh, what are your thoughts on JJ Ortega white side? <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, is he still incredible. on the Eagles? Oh yeah, no, it's incredible that he was drafted above uh, DK Metcalf. I mean that that wow. is going to go down as something that. I mean, look, we're back in the same spot as we were in 2020 and 2019, where the Philadelphia Eagles still need a wide receiver. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's keep going through some of the QBs here because we got to make the most of this final 18 minutes. And there are so many QBs to talk about. And Mac Jones, another one coming up here where uh, Bama QB, certainly a guy who's going to be in a system that has generated uh, some production. And I do think if I look through Mac Jones's numbers, I think for me, you know, he's sort of what we were talking about earlier, where the production can be there for some guys that maybe aren't quite as talented. And I don't want to say that Mac Jones is not talented. As you can see from this one play, clearly got a big arm hitting uh, Devonta Smith in full stride. For the most part with Mac Jones, to me, his numbers just screamed a guy who was taking some check downs, letting guys do the running work for him. 52% of his yards came on yards after the catch. A lot of short throws to 8.88 8 dot, a lot of short of the sticks throws. I think Mac Jones, if he gets to the right system, could be good. But I think he's a guy that's going to be overvalued because of having kind of the, the raw potential, the raw physicality and being from Bama. And I just don't think, I mean, the track record for Bama QBs, unless I'm missing someone, I haven't been the most impressed by. And I think to me, that's sort of what Mac Jones says. He's going to go high, but I'd rather have Zach Wilson. I'd rather have Justin Fields. And obviously, I'd rather have Trevor Lawrence. What, you're not a big A.J. McCarron fan? No, I mean, I, I'm happy for him I'm getting kidding. paid, happy for his dating <laughs> history. I think both those things yeah, are Yeah, there great. you go. There you go. That is good. Good for him. Um, look, yeah, Mac Jones is someone who, from a National Insider perspective, the odds seem to be in his favor to be Kyle Shanahan's next quarterback. Um, that whole conversation is fascinating because as Kyle Shanahan basically want to be the quarterback on the field and like have an extension of himself to hit these open receivers that mind you, they're going to be open for any quarterback that's back there. And if Mac Jones is your quarterback, then you're like basically handicapping yourself in a lot of ways, at least in how we're speaking about quarterbacks now with, with rushing upside and how they can maximize the ceiling of it. And I, I it's great. Like Mac Jones is someone who I went in wanting to dislike in some ways, but liked more than, than I expected. But if you give up that much, when it really comes down to two extra first round picks on top of the one that you trade up with, plus a third rounder, to not get someone with this insane athleticism, this insane ceiling and potential to this game that can, you know, elevate your team, even when it's figured out in like a two week span leading up to the Super Bowl or going against the best defenses at the NFL level, that would be a mistake to me. But who knows what's going to happen? We still have a month left. So. Yeah, and, I, and to his credit, I just have to say that he does have an 84% adjusted completion rate from PFF. Those are That's a good number. Accuracy is one thing I think we've seen over the years. That's an old adage in the NFL that um, you can't teach accuracy. I think we have seen them start to be able to teach accuracy a bit more to guys like Josh Allen. But um, to me, Jones, if you get him in the right system, he could be good. But it wouldn't shock me if you get him in the wrong system. That things do go south in a way that wouldn't be expected based off his college numbers. Uh, Pete, any thoughts here on Mac Jones based upon hearing his name, which I think sounds like a great QB yeah. name? Go ahead, Josh. What, yeah, what, what do you think about like these two wide receivers in this year's class, both Devontae Smith and Jalen Waddell saying, and what a question to ask by the media to two guys who play with Tua and Mac Jones to be like, oh, which quarterback do you prefer? And both outwardly saying it's Mac Jones. Do you, do you, does that mean anything to you just from like a person to person standpoint? 
Yeah, there's so much to unpack there too, right? When you say, which one do you enjoy playing? Like they didn't ask them who is the more pro-ready talent, right? Yeah. Like there's other intangible factors that are going to play into who is more fun to play with. You know, it's just like when you, if you ask MJ's and Kobe's teammates, was he a, a fun guy to play with? They wouldn't have said that. So I don't know if we can read into it too much. Um, and there's also just a natural probably recency bias too, right? Like they're always successful generally at Alabama. What's the most recent thing in front of mind? Mac Jones playing pretty well. Yeah. And, and he is the one trying to get into the NFL now. Meanwhile, Tua was the one who was the top six pick last season. So it's not like he needs their help anymore. So yeah. it's, uh, it, it, would, it's this weird dynamic that, you know, it's, it makes me uncomfortable this whole process at times because like we're putting so much pressure on these people who are just different human beings. Like imagine playing on national television in front of 80,000 people sitting all around you when you're 18 and 19 years old. And then now heading into a time when you could be making millions and millions of dollars at 21 or 22 years old and just asking them all those questions. I wasn't even a human, like an adult <laughs> at 21 or 22. And they just have to be perfect or else everything is nitpicked about them. And it's, uh, it's unfair. It's unfair. So. It's a lot like being a debutante, I would say. So good good that the men can have that as well. But I would say for me, one thing with Mac Jones, speaking to the why it's, these teammates might like him more or why his wide receivers may like him more than Tua. First of all, we saw with Tua that he's not, at least post-injury form, not a guy who's going to force the ball downfield as we saw you know, the Preston Williams and Devontae Parker's of the world's production go down when he was out there compared to uh, whoever else is playing QB. But also I think the fact that you know Tua is going to run a bit more, Mac Jones is going to be in the pocket. I just think that's going to naturally build something where if you're a, a wide receiver, it's kind of like Baltimore, like, and this is obviously the most extreme example, but you're a wide receiver there. You're just a vessel for whatever Lamar wants to do in a given play, whether he's going to actually throw it deep, whether he's going to run around and, you know, throw a little dink and dunk pass to you, whatever the case may be. Whereas if you're with Mac Jones, I imagine it's mostly going to be closer to the vest with what the play was called, getting the ball, to these guys, putting him in position to succeed. And I think that could be part of it too. I wouldn't necessarily take it as a, a character indoctrination as much as it is that Mac Jones actually might be more of a guy who creates production for those around him. Whereas a guy like Tua is probably a guy who's going to create more production for himself on the NFL level. If Mac Jones wanted to reshape his body in one month, what would be his first steps? Um, I mean, I, I think bench press. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, w I would think he would have access to some nutritionists <laughs> and trainers that might be able to help him out with this goal here. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe some shots to the butt. Who knows? Whatever. whatever he <laughs> yeah. in. You know, I'm well, always going to be a, the tout my intermittent fasting here, uh, do some fasted <laughs> workouts. Um, you know, I'll, I'll get him. I'll get him on the straight now. All right, so let's go to our first non-QB. Non we got a tight end here projected to go number four by NFL.com, Kyle Pitts. And Kyle Pitts is probably a guy, mm. even if you haven't been paying attention to NFL draft, I feel like he's the one I've seen video of pop up on social media timelines more than ever. Uh, the guy who I think people in the industry are buzzing about as much as anyone. A dude who gets big contested catches, has 4-4 four, four speed, um, kind of a, a modern tight end in a way that I think we we get some of these guys who come in and people want to cast the comparisons to Gronk and all those guys, but he's like a legitimately fast wide receiver Gronk with how everything I've seen from him. Uh, but Josh, you might've done a little more research here. So tell me your thoughts on Kyle Pitts and do you think he's worth all the hype and a tight end going to the top five potentially? Yeah, I mean, he's an incredible player and he's someone that can play in line. Uh, that is, you know, because he is, projected as a top five or top 10 selection. Everyone wants him to be perfect. And he's, he's, he's not perfect. Like he's, he's not this drive blocker, but who cares? <laughs> who cares? As long as, as he has will, as long as he tries in that area, everything else just compensates for it. Um, I also would not want to move him to purely a, a wide receiver and line him up, you know, as an ex ISO guy, because that, uh, that gets rid of a potential mismatch, you know, a, a, a matchup nightmare that he can be over the middle of the field. Now, my only concern is this. I, and I'm far from running an NFL team. It's never going to happen. That memory evaporated, that, that dream evaporated when I was 21 years old. Um, but tight end position takes so long to develop in the NFL. And like so often, even perfect ones that we love, you know, your OJ Howard's, your TJ Hawkinson's while they might be productive early on so often they don't hit their stride until their second team or their second contract. I mean, I can go down the list, Greg Olson, Jared cook, Delaney Walker, so on and so forth that we've been firm in our evaluations before at the tight ends. 
and it just takes two or three years because of how much is involved in the position that it might not get there. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Kyle Pitts is the one that breaks that. Yeah, I, I like Pitts a lot. One thing that jumps out to me, and it's a limited sample size thing, obviously only one year of college we're looking at. I don't, I don't think he didn't play the full season. Did he? He left like with one or two games left, if I'm remembering correctly. Sure. I think that sounds right. I don't know. It might not have happened. It might just been something I saw on Twitter. It was like, oh, yeah, he left early. But anyway, no cat, no fumbles, uh, no dropped catches. Like, those are two important things for a guy gaining that trust. I agree that he's going to have some adjustments to make. Like, he probably isn't going to be a good blocker right away. I haven't seen anything that indicates otherwise. But a 146 passer rating when he was targeted last year, the deep throws for him, an A dot of, is this, oh my God, is this right? He had a 13.9 A dot and had 18 yards per catch, yards per route run, 3.9 three like these are amazing numbers these are like george kittle numbers if he were playing all the routes and i he's got to go somewhere where they are going to play him but if they're playing him heavy early on i think kyle pitts to me is a tight end where if you get him lower than some of these other guys who maybe see the production for some of the i'm trying to think who would even be like a tight end like you're not taking him over travis kelsey but are you taking him over irv smith i think potentially that's sort of where i would go to where i think kyle pitts for fantasy is one of the more pro ready fantasy players out there and Josh, I'm curious your thoughts. We were looking at this the other night on our, our show, Ship Chasing, of looking at the draft and actually the fits in the top 12, the pits yeah. fits, that would work out. And I, I'm really rooting for four or five with the Bengals or the Falcons because I was going through a lot of those, and I don't want them to go compete with, you know, Gasecki or, you know, whoever, a lot of these other log jams. Do you have any other fits outside of those, or, or do you even like those? No, I, I, I do like those. Uh, I'll, I'll plug the show again on Monday. Charles Robinson says there's a, a great chance all five of these pass catchers or all four of these pass catchers are gone by the 11th overall selection. Wow. Which the last time, I think we had three, and correct me if I'm wrong, top 10 wide receivers, it was Corey Davis, Mike Williams, and John Ross. And that obviously didn't pan out for those teams. But um, adding Cal Pitts to that, and I don't think a tight end has ever been selecting the top five. Um, I don't know if you can do some quick was, homework was or your research. Ebron was top ten, but I correct. think correct. Yeah. Correct. So, so, so both teams that you mentioned in the Falcons and the Bengals um, are fascinating. I mean, we can't forget that the Falcons, and sure, it's a there's a change because it's a totally different general manager, totally different head coach. But they just spent a second round pick. I mean, they trade a second round pick for Hayden Hurst heading into last season. Um, well, Joshua, I hate to break the sea. We are a show about accuracy. And in 1960, Billy Cannon was taken number one overall. So I just want to excuse me. <laughs> Generational tight end. I, 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 you really should not bring me back on the show because I just screwed that. <laughs> How one do you up. not know Billy Cannon? Honestly, fantastic name. He should have been a QB, though, if, if anything. But. I bet I bench pressed more than Billy Cannon did back then. <laughs> now, yes. Now yeah. you definitely do. And actually, the highest modern tight end to go is number six, Kellen Winslow Jr., who, who okay. is a soldier, if you guys will recall. Oh, yeah. Well, let's not talk. We're we're just hitting on all the touchy subjects. <laughs> That's what Spags today. does, Josh. He he makes me come on this show. I I walk the tightrope act, and he tries to get me canceled, and I'm just like trying to keep my balance. I mean, I I just got a new job, and you're <laughs> testing that. <laughs> you are. He's got too many that. sponsors, though. He's sold out. That's why. But Josh, you're you're on the underdog football show. Like you got to keep it a little more grime. You got the brick wall. You got the trains. You know better than Pete does. <laughs> the uh, brick walls, the trains, and the outdated dicey references. It's all part of Josh's new personal brand. Yeah. Uh, let's do Justin Fields next because we have Jamar Chase, but Jamar Chase didn't play last year. He's going to be a highly touted prospect, a guy who Joe Burrow's politicking to get in there um, as a man who was projecting well to or project to be drafted highly rather going into the season, didn't need to play. But Justin Fields, our guy Ricky in chat wants to see. And, and here is my hot take, which I hopefully Ricky will be happy with. I think Justin Fields is the most fantasy viable quarterback from the jump, regardless of anywhere he goes. I think they're going to immediately play to his skill set. All the numbers jump out to me. He is a deep ball thrower. He is a runner. He is a guy who throws deep balls to accuracy and no fear. And the interception rates don't scare me off either. I think Justin Fields, to me, is the guy that I would want in fantasy. I don't know you draft a number one overall, but if he falls to your team, I think this is the big winner of the draft. I absolutely love Justin Fields. Um, I, I don't know what there isn't to like, and obviously I've never spoken to him, but just when when watching him, the ball launches from his hands. He absolutely is is willing to work inside the confines of a pocket, and then his acceleration is just absolutely outrageous, and you see it often. Like There's this play that Trey Sermon, the running back, has where he runs at 60 yards, and from behind him, Justin Fields is the one who just opens up and almost surpasses him trying to block for him 
down the field. And like there are plenty of plays. Like if you go back and watch his Penn State game, um, there's a free rusher on him and he takes like a, a blind bootleg almost, a blind rollout. And while he throws the football, he also gets hit at the same time. Both of those things happen before the the wide receiver is even turning back and looking for the football. I mean, it's it's insane things that he's doing out there. And Pete, my question to you is this, because it seems like we have the top three we know are taking quarterbacks. And it seems like right now Justin Fields would be a surprise at number three So to the 49ers. So then, like, who else out there? I firmly don't think the Panthers are taking a quarterback at eight, even if they stand there. So to me, I am, I am wishfully th- hoping and, and thinking and, and trying to make it happen that Justin Fields lands with the New England Patriots and Bill Belichick. Oh, and that Josh is McDaniels. interesting. That's what I'm hoping for. I mean, yeah, he can run. The issue for me, the one thing I see that's an issue is he does take a lot of sacks, but he also scrambles, and I think you can sort of cut those down. One thing that really jumped out to me, though, number four out of QBs last year and percentage of his yards that came from air yards, 70% of his throws were air yards based. So that was not guys getting open or or guys getting into space and then running the ball downfield. It was just him straight chucking, and that puts him, you know, and guys who really didn't have as great of a competition, the uh, NC State's QB, Devin Leary, uh, Tristan Gabbia from Oregon State. Uh, You're Zach making up names at this point. I do not know these people. <laughs> well, the point is, though, these are guys who are playing like weaker competition. I guess Oregon State and the Pac-12. I'm a USC guy, so I'll defend that slightly. But the rest of these guys, you know, playing not great teams. Fields is playing legit competition, airing it out, getting it downfield, getting results. And I think that does speak to something for me with Fields that I would take him over Mac Jones at the very least. But I, I think that, yeah, anybody who gets him, if he's under the top five, he's a six pick, seven pick, whatever the case may be. I think they're getting a great value. There, I mean, there are going to be teams that go up and get the other two quarterbacks that are perceived in the top five. And I mentioned the Broncos. I think the Patriots are up there. The Falcons are still fascinating to me because they're kind of at the crossroads that we talked about. Like, do they think that they can build a good enough roster to win in the next two or three years? I mean, Matt Ryan got his contract in 2022. Um, so is now the time, like when you're drafting in the top five to take a quarterback? I don't know. Other than the top five, it's 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 fascinating to me to figure out who is going to to take those other two quarterbacks. So. so let's talk one more guy we could squeeze in here because I think it's worth hitting on. I guess we're just doing the QBs. We probably were a little too ambitious trying to get multiple guys in, but QB Trey Lance is now projected. I know uh, Josh said that he doesn't think the Panthers will take a QB. NFL.com currently has them taking Trey Lance here, and he's also been linked to the Niners at number three. But he's a North Dakota State QB, and Pete, if you pull up his pro day highlight, I think that's the most noteworthy one uh, for him, but Kind of a smaller guy, kind of a PJ Walker type from what I could tell from my limited research. No data on PFF for him. I guess they have not been tracking North Dakota State that closely. But a smaller guy, I guess you could all say some Kyler Murray. Very big arm, as you'll see on this throw. Um, I think he's intriguing. I don't know enough about him. I, I think North Dakota State is Carson Wentz's alma mater, right? So I guess Correct. that's... And Easton that. Stick. Don't forget about Easton Stick. This is going to be their third oh, yeah. quarterback drafted, I think, in the last five or six years, which I, how many big-time programs have done that? I hear they're calling it quarterback you now. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what North Dakota State is known for. QBs and uh, what else is in North Dakota? Not not even Mount Rushmore is in North, North Dakota. So I honestly can't tell you one thing. That's the only kind of joke that's going to work on a draft, Nick, like Josh Norris. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, he's bigger than you think he is. I don't have like the, the official numbers, but he is bigger. And he's also only 20 years old. Um, so... He only played in one game this year. He's going to turn 20, I think, this summer or he was 29 when he was 19. And so a lot of his his tape is when he's 18 years old, which going back to wide receivers, that is shocking when talking about quarterback prospects. Um, he is an absolute battering ram as a runner. Like he'll just want to run over you. Uh, he He's interesting. And he is one that if there's a, one player like in the next three to five years that I wish I could fast forward and see their development – it's it's probably it's probably Trey Lance um, just because he only attempted about 16 throws a game and only has, I think, 16 or 18 games under his belt. So there's just like not a large sample size of him. But I'm fascinated to see what's going to happen with him uh, in the next few years. Um, and if I can just circle back on that Panthers comment, like the reason why I don't think the Panthers are taking one even at eight, even though it's perceived out there they're going to is because if they were, they were going to trade up to number three. Like this owner that they have, he is not risk averse. Like if they loved a quarterback, not named Lawrence or Wilson, they would have moved up to number three. And I have no doubts about that. So I, I just don't see them sitting at eight unless David Tepper sits back and says, oh, I don't want to watch Teddy Bridgewater for another 17 games, which uh, is a possibility as well leading up until the draft. 
Josh, I just want to say how seamlessly you said 17 games. You know, it's like putting the new year on your checks, you know, and it takes a while. I mean, you are just, you're a professional. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best. I even thought about this morning, Pete. Like, how are we going to even handle, like, win totals right now? Like, in, in my brain, I don't know how long it's going to take me yeah. to <laughs> adjust to all that. Like, when I see four and a half for the Texans, I'm like, huh. Eh. But then it's 17 games. But then how do we even count that yeah. 17th game? And like, when is that 17th game going to happen? So on and so forth. I've got no clue how to do any of this yet. Yeah, and so yeah. it's going to make for some uh, some regrettable content. Let's put it that way this summer. <laughs> I, I do like the idea of imagining like super drunk bros in Vegas just like hammering the unders on all of these because they're like, <laughs> this is too, no way, dude. <laughs> this is a steal. Bringing down the house. Let's go. Um, <laughs> Just one last note on Trey Lance's size because uh, Josh mentioned it. And I'll just give you guys this. this to close the loop. I'm a completionist of nothing else. Trey Lance, 6'4", 224. So, yeah, definitely bigger than – oh, yeah, they had Ricky Guy got it too. He must have Googled that. I know Ricky's had no, a lot of great – I've been following Ricky's <laughs> comments in here. I mean, he is – he's going to take Josh's old job at Roto World. I could tell. I mean, this guy well, is on top of his stuff. Well, RIP Roto World, Pete. How Sorry. dare you? He no, has NBC the Sports edge. edge. Get the branding right. <laughs> the inside edge to get there. See, that's, that's our, my thing. I, if I was like you, I would have just immediately – see, I'm still signing my checks with Roto World. Right, right. P Pete is still Roto World. He's still 16-game seasons. <laughs> At some point, we're going to you know, get into 2021. Here. I'm still in 1080 HD right, uh, right, cameras. Right, 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 like right. It's just ridiculous. Right, right. That's why they don't respect you in Barcelona. That's, <laughs> that's the main reason why it wasn't your, your skin tone. They just know that, oh, this guy's signing all his checks as a, a fantasy football website for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> All right. I think we've covered enough here. Any final guys you want to just mention here, Josh, to plant your flag so you could be like, oh, cool. Like I mentioned this guy back in April. No big deal. But uh, is there and anybody say else? Vault me. Say vault me after you say it. Uh, here's a fun name uh, just because it's fun to say. Josh Emerterbebe. Uh, Pete, homework right now. On Twitter, type in I-M-A-T-O-R-B-H-E-B-H-E. -E -E. Um, his oh his vertical jump. He actually floats, Josh, and it can, looks. Can you do, can you spell that one more time and a lot slower? I M A T O R B H E B H E. Imator Bebe. He has a forty-six and a half inch vertical. Um, he legitimately looks like if you just like search on video. No, I'm not on his. Tw I mean, like search it and then find like a, a, oh, a Twitter clip of it. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You then know what I keep videos. You know that song where he's like. I mean, look, look who's the first response. With my baby. <laughs> look, I'm, oh, I'm, just, I'm the go. only person talking about him. But go over to videos. I'm, I don't know why I'm pointing at my screen like you can see it. Um, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll find something of him with his his vertical jump. Now, oh, now, we're looking for. I'm not leaving till we find this. By the way, I okay, we're looking it. for vertical jump at his pro day. Um, oh, this. This. Seems like a vertical jump, Josh. Why is it going frame by frame? <laughs> like we're making oh, a game. internet. We're, <laughs> we're we're breaking piece of internet. It actually <laughs> looks like he float. Like maybe may, <laughs> we'll have to wait for for Pete's internet to kick back in. <laughs> but it it looks like it it is it is edited because he literally floats at the top of his jump. It's something I've never seen before. Yeah, this one, this one, this one. Um. Anyways, we'll get it in a moment. It's incredible. Anyone who's watching, open up a separate tab. It's something I've never seen before. Pete, oh, thoughts? Wow. <laughs> did, my, <laughs> did my internet, can you hear me? Or is my internet choppy? It's you, choppy. I think you're a little choppy, but it's, it, getting, it's, better. We're, we're getting, through it. it's getting better. It's getting better. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I think my internet had to support go. Uh, yeah. my baby here. There we go. Oh, look at that box jump. Wow. That but is. Did you see like the, the momentary like stop? Like the pause at the top, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah that's weird. It looks it's like he's got great form on his jump too. So I mean, that's part of it. But forty six. I mean, he like swings his arms like he's a helicopter. I mean, look at that. <laughs> that's real. That's not edited. That is real. What position not, is he? He's a wide receiver. At okay. Illinois. So I, if you were a tight end, I would say he's a new Albert Agui Boonham just based off his name alone. But <laughs> I mean, it's it's ludicrous. Everyone out there, go and check it out. It's it, it's insane. I've never seen it before, and I always love when that happens in this process. We talked about athleticism. We started with it. That. When you like break the mold, where you break the system, to me that's always fun, and I try to root for those guys. So, he'll be the vertical equivalent of John Ross. He'll still be terrible. But boy, can he fly upwards? There you go, <laughs> vertically. All right, Josh, give us the plugs for everything again here as we close out the episode. Sure, it's the Underdog Football Show. 
this Monday, premiere episode, JT O'Sullivan, Charles Robinson. We're also on YouTube. You can just check out like the, the tweet I just put out on Twitter, uh, at Josh Norris. I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, hopefully yeah. this is a, the last time. It's the first of many, as long as I yeah. still have a job after this. Thanks, guys. <laughs> are you are you guys live streaming? Uh, are, the, are your pods going to be uh, pre-recorded? We're absolutely going to do a whole bunch of live streams uh, since Underdog absolutely is a draft platform. And if no one out there, I'm sure all of your viewers and listeners do play on Underdog. But if you're not and you want to deposit, just use promo code Josh Norris. Um, and it's, it's the best. I mean, we have some really awesome new games coming up, too. Uh, I'm glad you didn't put me on the spot because this might be the first time that I revealed some trade secrets that I shouldn't Ooh. have. Um, but just check out as soon as the NFL draft is over, about a day or two after that, some really cool, fun games that are new for everyone out there. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be an awesome off season over at Underdog. Oh yeah, going to be lots of lots of drafts on Underdog on this channel throughout the summer too. Getting ready for uh, randomizer drafts and uh, Josh, we'll have to get you in to uh, to battle yes. the randomizer on Underdog. Let's do it. I can't wait. All right. Um, yeah, we're going to draft Josh and Mr. Bebe, aren't we? There you go. <laughs> I'm still impressed by that man jumping. I don't even have anything to say. But yeah, I guess uh, Pete's got to give close this out with the big plugs for his, for the NFTs and for everything else coming up. But for me, check me out on Osmo streams. I'm doing a ton of content there, including in 55 minutes. Got a show covering both the NBA and MLB. And uh, because of this show, I've done maybe not enough prep for that. So <laughs> tune in, in 55 minutes and come hang out with me on the Osmo channel and follow at Chris Spags. Yeah, we are on this channel here in less than two hours. Uh, we're throwing up the day club. Uh, I hear Pete Manzanelli is going to be there. We got Levitan, Soccer Dave. We're going to talk Man's Coin, Zed Horsey's Top Shot, all the usual degenerate NFT stuff. So thank you to Josh Norris for joining us today. Uh, we also have the iTunes version of the podcast, all those links down below. For Chris Spags, I'm Pete Overzet. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>